welcome everybody on the, uh, I believe, first, uh, well, definitely first in this session, um, talk uh, in the automation testing and analysis track um, called uh, Advanced GitLab CI CD for Fun and Profit. The presenters are Iñaki Mariba and Mikhail Hoffman, and I'm going to let them introduce themselves. Thanks. Thanks, Mark. Um, so yeah, we are going to try to explain a little bit how we do um, what we like to think as uh, advanced uh, GitLab CI CD uh, and not dying in the process and trying to have a little bit of fun. Um, first of all, we are uh, members of the CKA team. Uh, CKA stands for Continuous Kernel Integration. We basically run CI as a service uh, for the Linux kernel. Um, we try to prevent uh, bugs from being merged into the kernel trees, but uh, we also manage the CI infrastructure for Red Hat kernel developers uh, now that we, that we are moving to GitLab uh, workflow. Basically what we do is um, we spawn GitLab pipelines uh, for each kernel revision and we test them in Bker, which is a hardware provisioner. Um, we also have uh, a lot of deployments on different platforms, uh, such as OpenShift, OpenStack, uh, Beaker, AWS, EC2, Lambda, a lot of places. And all our services depend on RabbitMQ as a messaging uh, uh, fabric for getting uh, data across all the, all the applications. Uh, you can find more information about us on CKI. Uh, dash project.org is our web page. We have all our documentation public in there, but we also have all our code public hosted on gitlab.com slash um, CKI project. We have around uh, 70 microservices and cron jobs, and uh, we have an average of 20 changes merged and automatically deployed per day. Uh, and we are going to try to explain a little bit how we uh, stay sane after all that. Um, so yeah. Uh, Kind of in uh, the same line with previous uh, talk, try to keep <laughs> the abstract uh, not so complex. Do not promise too much stuff, otherwise you don't want to have enough time. But we are going to try to uh, explain how we deliver uh, features uh, as fast as possible, uh, trying to use state-of-the-art continuous integration and continuous delivery and deployment uh, setup that it's based on GitLab. Uh, for this talk, we prepared uh, examples. We are going to try to show some snippets, uh, but you will be able to find all of them in the link uh, that's in there, basically in our GitLab namespace. Uh, you should be able to find not only the snippets that we show on the talk, but also uh, real projects working end-to-end -end from uh, uh, applications to the deployments. So it's a really nice thing to follow. We're going to try to divide the presentation in two parts. First, an explanation, and if we have enough time, uh, a small live demo of how the, uh, a small pinch of piece of code can go from a merge request to a deployment in a few minutes. Uh, first, why do we call profit? Uh, the idea is to have an advantage, uh, to take benefit of what we do. So we have uh, a common CI pipeline that we use to build, test, and deploy all our projects the same way. Uh, and a common continuous deployment pipeline that we use uh, on a single infrastructure repository based on GitOps, uh, where all the pipeline, all the deployments are going to get triggered and uh, the applications deployed to production, staging, or different uh, environments depending on, on the needs. But we try to keep this fun. What fun means to us, it's, as I said, trying not to die in the process of keeping uh, deployment uh, consistent across different projects. Uh, if you maintain several projects, trying to keep all these uh, requirements of uh, testing and code quality, it's not simple if you don't have a unified process. So adding a new project to all these rules should be pretty straightforward without any trouble. You shouldn't be reading a lot of documentation. The code should be uh, self-documenting uh, and uh, you should be able to start just from reading the examples. Um, we also like to have the pipelines as uh, a source of truth for the changes. So we make all pipelines fail if something in some condition is not met. And uh, <clears throat> that keeps uh, everyone honest about the rules. And if the rules are the same on all the projects, it's, it's way simpler. But um, 
how we do this. So basically, we do everything on GitLab. Uh, they say they are the DevOps platform. It's basically uh, a platform that uh, merges uh, Gitforge, uh, CI, CD, Engine, uh, um, container repository, and uh, a lot of other things like issue, issue management and project management and many features. Um, it's a relatively relatively a new project, uh, but they've been adding features way faster than the competitors, so they are grown super fast. Their development it's completely in the open. You can see from the all the their workday uh, in uh, public, but also all the rules they use to develop. It's 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 really nice thing to see. Uh, the only thing is that they are an open core. <clears throat> that means that the core of the product uh, product is free. You can use it. You can host it. But there are some features that are under a subscription uh, model. Good thing is that they uh, provide an open source program. Uh, that means they give all the top tier features for free for open source projects, uh, without but without the support. Um, as I said, we provide uh, an example uh, project, so you can follow along with the talk. Uh, all the projects are hosted in our namespace at GitLab. It's a, a subgroup called DevConf CZ. Um, there you will find a few projects like DevConf example common, which is the place where we are going to put all the common code, the libraries, and the scripts. Uh, DevConf example app one, which is a small sample application that uses all the things that we are going to explain, and uh, an infrastructure <coughs> project uh, that will contain the GitOps, uh, all the infrastructure uh, um, repository. So what we mean when we talk about CI, just uh, an, an overview, we create pipelines and we run them. These pipelines build and tag the container images that we use uh, as, a deploy, as a delivery platform. We deliver all our applications as container images. Um, all those pipelines also run unit tests. These tests are run in Tox. Uh, for those that are not uh, Python developers talks is basically uh, a helper that manages virtual environments, but also run, knows how to run tests and linters. Um, so we run our tests in there, but we also run them on container images and on the projects <clears throat> that depend on, on this. Um, we also have a way to visualize and uh, enforce code coverage. Um, GitLab allow, uh, knows how to parse uh, coverage results, so it's, though these are, they are displayed really nicely on the diffs in the merge requests. But also, as I said, we like to fail pipeline when something is not good, not right. So we have the, the option to fail the, uh, the pipelines if, if the code coverage decreases with uh, a merge request. We also have an approval rule, which is uh, a way to um, uh, enforce that the code owners uh, approve the, the changes before they get merged. When you change a file, the owner of that file needs to review your merge request and approve it. And we enable some uh, security checks, such as secret detections and uh, dependency uh, analysis on, on GitLab CI. GitLab, uh, what it looks like, um, a GitLab pipeline, it's basically a YAML file uh, hosted on the project, on the repository. This means that the file it's git tracked. You can uh, um, see the history of how the file changed. You can have different files on different branches, and you can uh, manage the changes of the CI configuration just as you would do with any other change of, of the code. You uh, can open a merge request, and the merge request will run the changes of your, uh, uh, like the, the new pipeline you're trying to create. In our example, we're going to use uh, a, a pipeline a little bit more complex. For those that are not uh, used to GitLab CI, basically the bubbles are jobs. The jobs are the things that run the building and the testing and the, the things that you want to run. The columns are um, is what we call stages. It defines the order in which the jobs are going to be executed. Of course, the green mark uh, means that a job was successful. The gray mark means that a job is waiting for user input. And these are what GitLab calls multi-project pipelines or child-parent pipelines. There are pipelines triggered by this one, but on another project. Um, something very important, now getting into GitLab uh, configurations, something very important to, determine, to configure is when to run the pipeline. 
it's a uh, GitLab provides a feature that is called workflow rules uh, and lets you define when you want these pipelines to be spawned. In this case, we use uh, pre-defined GitLab variables. This one that starts with CI underscore. And uh, this configuration allows you to get a pipeline for a merge request. When you open a merge request and push to a merge request, you will get a pipeline. But also for the default branch, when in this uh, reference it's in master, or main, or what your default branch is, you will get a pipeline. Also, uh, when it's triggered as a dependent pipeline, as I said, with multi-project multi, uh, pipelines, and uh, the user has the option to trigger a new pipeline by pressing a button on the UI in, in GitLab web page. Something important to enable it's uh, the merge result pipelines to get the merge pipelines in the merge request, but also merge trains. Merge trains is a nice feature that GitLab has that if you um, happen to merge more than one merge request in this, uh, like in line, you would the, the, the following merge requests will get tested uh, on top of the previous one. That uh, will prevent you from getting a red pipeline on the default branch. Uh, because maybe two changes were merged at the same time that both uh, worked, but both together didn't. So this way you can change merge requests and they only get merged if the CI is green with all of them together. As I said, we, de we deploy and uh, deliver applications using uh, container images. So for us, it's really important to build these containers uh, reproducibly. Um, we do this on a CI image. So the first time we need uh, to build an image for the image building. So this chicken and egg problem uh, is something we had and we solved using the upstream builder uh, image. We use builder for building the image, for um, logging in to the registry and for tagging and pushing the, the images. Um, we use GitLab registry. Each project comes with uh, its own registry. So we use that for pu publishing our images. And we tag all the images with different tags. For example, each pipeline has its own tag for the images. Each commit and each merge request, if it succeeds, it gets its own tag as well. Uh, the default branch head gets a latest tag. And we have also other tags that we use for deployments, such as uh, production and uh, staging. Uh, we wanted to make a point in here uh, that this is uh, one of the things that we want to uh, talk about. The, the most important things from the talk is that we want to explain how we are sharing code across all our projects. We try to keep our, ourselves uh, consistent between projects, as I said, so we try to uh, keep all the code and try to do not repeat ourselves. Um, for this, we use several things like uh, GitLab features, such as includes. We reuse fragments of uh, container files across all the applications. We shared uh, images for the dependencies, and we have common Python libraries. We're going to try to explain a little bit what that means. Um, we use, for example, uh, what GitLab provides, uh, that it's two, key two very important keywords that are include and extends. Uh, include lets you import into your uh, YAML files, external files, or uh, merge fi basically merge files into the current project uh, YAML. This lets you both um, create templates for the job to reuse the code and also use pieces provided by other parties such as GitLab. Uh, you can include files uh, locally from the project, but you can also include them from another project hosted in the same, uh, in the same GitLab instance. Also, you can use uh, generic URLs that can be fetched uh, through HTTPS. And as I said, GitLab provides a certain set of, of templates, uh, mainly for uh, security check proper purposes and other things that are common between uh, projects. So you can reuse the code that they provide by using includes. There are some special jobs that start with a dot. Uh, in the YAML, the, the, the name of the job starts with a dot. That's what they call hidden jobs, and they are not processed by GitLab. So you can use this, plus an extend keyword that lets you override properties on the jobs to create very simple templates and very simple um, CI configurations on your applications. The extend job lets you get any job, the extend keyword lets you get any job and uh, change some of the parameters uh, to 
um, customize them for your for your application use case. Um, another thing that we share is container file fragments. Uh, most of our applications are Python, so there are a lot of things that they have in common, such as uh, setting the base image or installing uh, certificates or installing the application itself. So we split all these pieces and we use the C preprocessor to merge them back into a single container file. These tasks uh, encapsulate common things like cleanup and uh, lets you get uh, the resulting uh, container files with something like this. This is the C++, C++, uh, C++ preprocessor um, uh, include uh, syntax, so you can get the, um, the fragments included into your uh, container file, and uh, just those five lines are um, enough to get a working um, application from that container file. What we also share is the CI container images. We have um, an image that is generic, that contains all the dependencies necessary for running all the CI CD jobs, but also for the development tasks. For example, uh, we use this image for building and tagging the containers. So it contains helper scripts, it contains uh, the container tools like Builda and Scopio, but it also contains these reusable fragments that I mentioned already built in the image. So you can use them both on CI and on local development the same way. It also has tools like Git and Python and uh, some other deployment tools like uh, Kubernetes, uh, command lines, and JSON YAML parsers. <clears throat> and last, uh, what I mentioned is this uh, shared Python library that we have. Uh, it's a way we found to consolidate code on a single place to define a single way to do things, such as detecting when an application is running on production or in a staging environment, and uh, for example, logging configuration for Python. Uh, configuring Python logger is not really straightforward. It takes some time. So having a single place where to put all these configurations and uh, being able to use them on all the applications the same way, it's uh, it's a really big plus. Oh, plus. And also you can configure the log levels in a sing single way. So debugging turns out to be uh, way easier. Another examples, another things that are not included in this example are, for example, Prometheus metrics and message queue handlers. Uh, those you could, uh, you can find them on our production projects, which is CKA project slash CKA live. Uh, there are a lot of uh, other uh, way things we we unified in the CKA live, and it's a really nice example for everything. On the left uh, uh, half of the slide, you can see a working application almost. The only thing that it's missing to define is the callback. And you can see how each of the methods, uh, there's a comment on the top. Uh, for example, Prometheus init, uh, what it does is it gets the um, environment uh, variables uh, from the host. Same with Sentry, um, same with message queue. And for example, in this case, uh, the message queue helper contains a lot of metrics that are really useful for the users. For example, uh, how many messages it consumed, how long it took to process them, and uh, the load of the consumer. So, and you have to do any, nothing e extra from the application side, but to initialize the Prometheus server. Uh, everything else comes uh, built in. So any change we can do in, the, in there, we, any metric we add, it gets automatically applied to all our applications instantly, and we only uh, need to rebuild it, rebuild the images and redeploy them. We also have a bit, uh, a small, on this shared application and shared library, we have some scripts, the ones we use for linting, the ones we use for testing, and also a common entry point for all our images. Uh, so all of them have a, the same way to define how applications run. We use the same entry point everywhere. It, uh, uh, it's in charge of uh, starting all the applications, but also keeping, uh, like, following them through the life cycle, and if one of them dies, killing the whole container. This also handles uh, logging, handling, and uh, a few other things. And uh, now, Michael. <laughs> okay. I will continue with the uh, second half of the presentation. So I'm going to, to start talking about the testing aspect. So 
we said that we wanted to test in three ways. So the first one would be to test with Tox. This is really easy to use locally, um, but it doesn't really correspond to your production environment. If you use Tox, you might use different Python versions, you might use different package versions, um, but it allows you to easily hook in all kinds of linters. So that's what's done in the job definition on the left side. You can just pip install Tox, run it. It will look up what it's supposed to do in the setup configuration file. And in our case, it's calling a shell script coming out of the common library, which will run all kinds of testers and linters, whatever you have, you can just plug in there. The important part is that you enable a setting in GitLab, which is pipelines must succeed before merge, so that actually these green pipelines are required for merging your new code. We also test in the production environment container images. Well, it's not the production environment, but in the production container images. There, we don't care too much about the linting, but we want to make sure that actually running those unit tests in those images still succeeds. So we take uh, the images that we use, or uh, that we produce in the first step, and install the devil dependencies on top, and then kick off the unit tests. So for example, on the left, that would mean that we also need to install the responses pip package on top of everything that is needed for running the production or like the deplo deployed code. The third aspect that we want to test is whether we break any dependent projects. So we have a common library. If we change one of those interfaces, it might actually break any consumers of those interfaces and we want to prevent this. GitLab provides something called parent-child pipelines that can actually cross projects. So this is on, seen on the left in the top. We can put in a trigger keyword where we specify which project should be triggered. In this case, we want to trigger the app project and trigger a pipeline there. And we can also specify variables that get injected into those pipelines as well. In this case, we specify the source code that should be used instead of the source code in the default branch for this common library. And then in the dependent pipeline, we run a shell script to override the production or like the default branch version of those packages with our like unmerged code. And we do this both for the container images so that we get like custom container images that contain this new code, but we also do this in the Tox environment. And we encapsulate this into a helper script because it, it's, it's slightly more magic than what's on this slide. If we run those pipelines, we then see um, the Linton test job. So this was the first one that runs in Tox. We see the test job that runs in this container image that we are going to deploy. And we also see this last uh, dependent pipeline job that triggers the downstream pipeline in the application project. And only if this downstream pipeline passes will your pipeline be green. So this enforces also the contracts that we have for these libraries that it shouldn't break any consumers. We also want to visualize code coverage. This is important for developers, but it's even more important for reviewers so that they see actually which lines of the code are covered by the unit testing. GitLab has nice support to visualize coverage in the diff. So you see these green bars for the lines that are covered by the unit tests. And then there's one line here where we are missing coverage. If we, and yeah, so and if you use something like coverage, which is a Python tool to that can output XML files with the coverage information, we can hook it into GitLab via this artifacts keyword and then GitLab automatically in the merge request will show you the lines that are covered by your testing. We also give it a regular expression so that it can parse the job blocks and determine the percentage of lines covered. And this becomes important if you want to enforce code coverage, or at least we want to enforce that code coverage doesn't drop, basically force developers to write new unit tests for the new code that they add to a project. There's something inside of uh, GitLab projects that's called 
approval rules and we can add an approval rule for coverage. And that basically means that as long as coverage increases or stays the same, nothing needs to be approved. But in the case that coverage drops, a certain team member or certain team members, for example, your team lead is required to chime in and approve your code change and acknowledge the fact that you're actually submitting something that will drop code coverage. Speaking about approvals, we are using code owners files, which is a standardized way of specifying who's kind of, uh, the, or who are the people responsible for code in a certain project. GitLab has this concept of pro protected branches where you can basically say, if you want to merge to this branch or you want to push to the branch branches, then um, you need to get approval by certain people. It will take this file out of the branch responsible. And again, if this is configured in your merge request, you see these boxes that there's an approval required. People will get an email and then they can press a magic button on the merge request to approve after review um, before things can get merged. The third, third thing that can be hooked into approval rules is security scanning. We enable three example scanners that are available with GitHub. One is um, a container image scanner, which basically scans the packages in the image. This needs a supported base image. In our case, it's UBI, so that's supported. But for example, Fedora, last time I checked, is not supported. We also want to scan our Python dependencies, um, for example, for supply chain attacks. But yeah, we would know after the fact, at least. And we also want to check whether we accidentally leak secrets, for example, because we committed um, a local configuration file into our merge request by accident. Again, there's an approval rule that you can enable where somebody needs to acknowledge that you are introducing certain potential vulnerabilities in the code with your merge request. So that was it for continuous integration. But now that we have all those images built, we also want to deliver and deploy them. As said, we have one common GitHub's, GitOps infrastructure repository where we can deploy everything into production. But we also want to easily deploy individual projects from the merge requests themselves. We want to deploy into different environments, production, staging, or dynamic environments to check out the changes and look uh, at, for example, the web interface of an application. And if something fails, we actually want to go back as fast as possible to the last working version. Setting this up is easier than it actually sounds. So first we deploy into a Kubernetes cluster. Um, in the example, we just use Kubernetes YAMLs that are slightly pre-processed with env subs from the get text package, which basically replaces uh, environment variable references in text files. So the first job is the lint job that runs uh, before anything else is done, which just validates that those YAMLs are actually correct after they are processed and that they would be most likely accepted by the server. And then in the second step, we just deploy everything for each merge, for each pipeline run uh, on the default branch. That keeps everybody honest, so there's nobody that actually considers changing anything on the production environment directly, a suitable way of, of persisting change because it will not be persisted. Next time anybody works on the infrastructure repository, everything will get redeployed. This works very nicely for Kubernetes or for Ansible, where things will not change if they don't need to. Now, because these jobs actually uh, will increase quite, quite easily, so CKI deploys, I think, 150 jobs each time somebody changes something on the infrastructure repository. There's a feature called matrix jobs in GitLab, which allows you to specify um, jobs that are very similar. In this case, they only differ in the project name variable. And so for our deployment jobs, we are going to log into the cluster and then deploy the YAMLs depending on the project name variable. So for example, here we're going to deploy 
the application for our example, but we're also going to deploy two different resource files that are related to the deployment itself. Speaking about deployment, so what, what are we actually going to use for, for running our uh, workloads? So we have four namespaces. One is for putting anything that's related to deployment. And then we have three namespaces corresponding to production, staging, and testing environments. To make this happen from GitLab CI pipelines, we have a service account. So this one is the one at the top that gets deployed into the deployment namespace. And then for each other namespace for production, staging, and testing, we have a role binding of the service account to the admin role. So basically our GitLab CI jobs in the infrastructure repository get admin access to those namespaces and can modify resources um, as needed during deployment. Only problem now is that actually the cluster we use for deployment is on the internet. So it can't be reached from the public GitLab workers. The solution is to deploy our own GitLab runner into this Kubernetes OpenShift cluster, um, which is again, quite a bit easier than it sounds. So we want to have a uh, GitLab runner spawn jobs for those uh, CI jobs in the pipeline. That needs a service account needs to give access to the service account with added rights, so it's able to create pods. And then it needs a deployment config or deployment for the GitLab runner. And this is mostly what's, what's needed. So there's not much more, more to that. So if you want to see the details, you can take a look at the example repositories. So the only thing that's not shown is the configuration file. And if you register that one with the infrastructure repository, you get this nice little green dot next to our uh, registered runner saying that this runner is online and it can actually run deployment jobs on the cluster that's going to be used for running uh, also those container images. Now, we have this infrastructure repository. We can deploy the world by triggering pipelines there, but this is actually not what we want to do normally while working on those applications. What we want to do is we want to have a merge request open and we want to deploy this code into a dynamic environment, but we maybe we also want to deploy it already into production to make sure that actually the code that's going to hit the default branch works. For that, we are going to trigger, again, dependent pipelines. This time, we are triggering them in the infrastructure repository. So the code in the source repository of our application, so this is for this example, Flask app, we're going to tag the container image that we want to deploy as production. And then we're going to trigger a child pipeline with curl. Um, and then in our infrastructure repository, we are selecting the correct jobs. So we don't want to trigger all jobs every time we are working on one of our services, but we only want to trigger very selectively um, what we are going, going to trigger there. As said, we might want to deploy into different environments. So there needs to be some, some way of actually first telling where to trigger and then also getting Kubernetes to actually roll out new images. For rolling out a new image, we need to convert the production tag that we put on those images, for example, to digest so that when we apply them to the cluster, the cluster knows, oh, there's something that changed about this image. So it rolls out a new version of our deployments. And the second thing is that we need to have some machinery in place that we can tell it, okay, please deploy this into production and please deploy this into staging. So the way we do this is by putting a deployment tag variable on those jobs and some shell magic in the background will basically take care of taking the right image and handing this through to the infrastructure jobs so that it knows where this new uh, container image needs to be deployed. Depending on how we configure those jobs, these deployments can happen automatically. So for example, for a merge request, we want to automatically deploy them into a dynamic environment that, that also gets stopped uh, after the merge request is closed. So basically, the reviewer can take a look whether the application actually uh, implements what it promises. We also 
might want to deploy into production right out of the merge request or manually in this case. And if you merge to the default branch, so the merge request is closed, depending on the policy of the project, we might want to automatically, for example, deploy into the staging environment and then have somebody press the button to deploy the changes into production after checking that everything still works. GitLab provides history for those environments. So as GitLab has native support for each environment, for, for environments, so for each environment, it records all the deployment jobs that ran for them. So rolling back is actually quite easy because we keep all those old container images around. They're all tagged by the pipeline ID. All those jobs still exist. And you can rerun these jobs. Basically, th those old jobs will tag those old images again, for example, with uh, production, and then just rerun the deployment job in the infrastructure repository. So this will take about one, two minutes for stuff to roll back to an old container version, um, which is good enough. So if your cluster is fast and spinning up jobs, it might just take 30 seconds. So to summarize, the stuff we built here is about uh, 700 lines of bash and YAML, a um, bit of container file fragments. So this is actually not a lot. The most important part is that it brings down the costs for bringing up a new project to, let's say, 100 lines on average, which is far less. So if we agree that this functionality is something that we would want to have in each project, this basically uh, cuts down 600 lines uh, that we would copy around. And most importantly, we can have we have a central place where we can change how stuff works. We can extend features, and they, these features will be available to all individual projects. A set like CKIS, I don't know, maybe 30, 40 microservices. So each of them will inherit new features automatically. And yeah, so this this is actually running in production at CKI. It's a bit more complex because uh, yeah, we tend to add features to things. As a last slide, I want to mention that obviously this is not the only way to do those things, also not the only way to do those things in GitLab. If you hate Bash, um, you might want to reconsider different implementations or you might want to add features that are provided by, by other solutions. So running pipelines is obviously not only possible in GitLab, you can do it in GitHub, you can use Tekton or OpenShift pipelines. VShip container images, but you might actually build those container, container images differently. You might want to ship AMIs for uh, EC2 machines. So depending on that, you might want to, to build images differently. We have a shell script for linting and testing, but pre-commit is very nice for hooking all kinds of linters into your pipelines. You can spin up integration tests in GitLab CI, basically Docker Compose, and make sure that your container images actually spin up correctly. We didn't do this in this example. If you have a lot of GitLab repositories, you might want to automate the setup and all of those uh, configuration settings. GitLab has an API that lets you do this. We only showed very few security scanners, but there are far more. There are static and dynamic application testing. You can do fuzzing. You can generate software bill of materials. All of those things are available. And if you have to do this work once, you are maybe more likely to do it, and it would apply to all projects that you have. For GitOps, we just used very simple templating. But uh, at CKI, we use Ginger templates. But you can do templating also with Ansible. You can use Helm charts. The different ways of actually templating your, your applications and reduce duplication again to a minimum. For secrets, we use GitLab secrets. And that clearly doesn't scale. Um, you can use Ansible Vault. You can use HashiCorp Vault. Especially if you think about secret rotation, you might have other tools that might help you there. And, might be a more scalable solution to this problem of managing secrets. And then for the deployments itself, we did this with an OC apply, but you can use the, Kubernetes, uh, the GitLab Kubernetes agent. You can use Argo CD. You can use Flow. There are different ways of actually putting stuff into production, where actually also the state of your production environment is taken into account. That might be at least more featureful than, than what we've presented here. So, um, so much for the uh, presentation.
we can do a demo, but I'm not, I'm not sure whether we want to do a demo. Um, I'm not sure. I think we have a few minutes. <laughs> so I, I can I can try to do a demo. So you right, know, it's okay. live. It might fail. That's how things work. So yeah, Let's see how the cluster goes. So um, let's try this. So this is this is the replic uh, application repository. Um, where we have an app that basically will show a simple web page and uh, all these configured to be green. And I don't know how the most like color would be. Um, I can tell it's color. I will find out. Um, so we're going to create a new change in there. Yes, going to push it to GitLab. You will have to explain your just do shortcuts in GitLab. Yeah, yeah just, just, trying to, just trying to get this, this deployed in there. Okay, so what do you do? Um, we deployed, um, or we created a merge request, changing the color of the website from green, which is the default, to magenta. So this is the merge request. This is in the application repository. And we see that GitLab tries to run a pipeline on here. And that's why I wanted to do it now, because that might actually take a while. So it's going to build our container image, trying to run all the testing. Uh, sorry, sorry for our jumping in. Image. Just, uh, Michael, you, yeah. your audio is a choppy, because you are using Firefox. That's not an issue. Just uh, you have to speak slowly. Then, then it kind of works, you know. Okay. All right. Okay. So GitLab spun up this pipeline, um, and we'll wait for it, and see um, whether we can deploy this into our cluster. So, for a reference, this is the production environment, and what the application will show in there which is green text. And then we have a staging environment. It's green text. And then I prepared two different versions of it. One is the blue version, and one is the red version. So those environments are dynamic. And now maybe we get the chance to deploy this new merge request even into production. But this depends on those testing jobs to run. On the right side, we see our cluster. So this is the deployment namespace, the production namespace, the staging namespace, and then those two testing versions that I prepared already, where you have like two different colors. So yeah. You can do something with the prepared one. Let's say we have the red version that is deployed into um, a dynamic environment already. And we could say, like, we really want to have production red. We can press this button. Try. And now we see what's going to happen, because that's kind of the thing. Um, normally, we would expect that, that the pipeline will appear. So it's started to kick off a production job. And that should actually spawn a job on our cluster that then can actually deploy this version into production. So I'm not counting, but maybe 30 seconds. Um, but this is actually going to deploy. Oh, so you see that now GitLab Runner is going to run the deployment job on our cluster. And there goes our de production deployment. It's run, rolling out a new revision of the deployment config. You can check. It was green. And it's red. So OK, our DevOps presentation worked. I think I will stop here, because otherwise stuff will maybe break or something. Um, 
and stop stop the screen sharing. Okay. So so much for the demo. So I will, I will just stop there because I'm a bit scared um, to do more. So yeah, if if, you, if there are any questions, I think we still have a couple of minutes. Yeah. I just yeah. just wanted to point out uh, the thing that all the code that we shown and the demo that Michael shown it's uh, <clears throat> public available on the links uh, we had. I'm gonna try to link it on the chat as well. Uh, you should be able to see everything in action and uh, basically copy paste the chunks of the code and that should just work. Okay. Uh, regarding the questions, uh, Inaki was uh, quite busy actually answering the questions, uh, but uh, they, it would not be on the recording. So. I believe it might be good uh, if I read the question and you can you can reply on the record, so to say. So let's start with uh, with the first one. Uh, what kind of permission is necessary to use include in CI other project files on same GitLab instance between couple projects? I'm gonna go with that one. Let's do one on one. That one is easy. Um, as I mentioned, there are different kind of includes. The one we use is a file. The one you mentioned that it's uh, the one that can fetch a file from a different project in the same GitLab instance. For that one, it, uh, GitLab uses the uh, permissions of the user that triggered the pipeline. Um, there are others, like for example, when you include a plain URL that cannot handle any uh, um, authentication at all. So the URL has to be publicly available, but for uh, including files uh, between projects, uh, the, the, the project could be private as long as the user triggering the pipeline has uh, enough permissions to access it. Okay, thank you. Uh, another one, how the final container file is built with C hash includes. Michael, do you want to go with that one? Yeah, so Builder basically has this um, little known feature to run stuff through CPP in case um, if your file has the in um, extension. So it will transparently try to do this if you have CPP installed. And it's basically doing what you would expect. So it's, uh, it's, it's looking up um, the reference files in the include path. So if you have like a setup file sitting in your include path, during your builder run, it will include this there. There are some interesting interactions if you if you define um, stuff with um, define and if def, uh, try to reference those things. But it works very well uh, as a very simple way of customizing those container files. But you could do something similar with Jinda, I suppose. So I think the most important part is to to try to do this uh, to reduce the duplication. It doesn't really matter much how you do it. All right, thank you. Next one. Uh, do you have all variables defined in the main project and using them in dependent projects? I had a small chat with uh, Christoph. I hope that's correctly pronounced. Um, we try not to use the project variables in GitLab CI CD, um, mostly because they are not really obvious to the user. It's not simple to find them. But also, they have different hierarchies. You could have project variables, or group variables, and subgroup variables. So it's not super handy. Uh, and also, they are not version tracked. So we had to uh, develop something to keep uh, control of what's on those variables and what's not. So we try not to use them. And when it's necessary, it's usually for some kind of uh, token or something that is necessary across uh, more than one project. So we use runner variables for that, which we also have uh, version control. Um, you can do the same as you would put a variable on the project. You could put it on the runner, and when the job runs in there, it's already populated. So you just assume it's in there. I, I think that was the point of the question, if I understood correctly. Yeah, I believe Christoph also confirmed. And the last question, if I'm not on misunderstood, if I'm not mistaken, it's: Do you use dependency proxy? Will it work with Quay IO? We don't use it. Um, we mirror container images ourselves. The main reason being that uh, we couldn't make the dependency proxy work with forks. So um, 
if somebody runs and stops from from forks for whatever reason there's some some interesting interactions there that basically make those jobs not not available uh, make the dependency proxy not available to them but you need to specify the proxy in your ci files so this kind of makes it really hard for other people to contribute um, because those pipelines <clears throat> for people that don't have permission to run in the forks so i think yeah we've, we've never figured that out but yeah we've, we've we have most problems uh, docker and pull limits so we just mirror those things into gitlab uh, container registry and yeah works very well for us okay uh, next, another question popped up uh, do you have classes of jobs where the gitlab uh, GitLab pipelines are not in the repo to be tested, but managed centrally somewhere else? Um, yes, <laughs> we have uh, all the CI itself will run for the kernel testing uh, behaves that well that way. Basically, the project, uh, the, the merge request triggers directly a child pipeline or a multi-project pipeline on a different project. Uh, that's the one that fetches the code and runs the tests. It's uh, doesn't uh, I mean it's not what GitLab CI it's uh, uh, was created for. So it has it, it needs a lot of hacking around. Um, but yeah, I don't know if there's a question about that. But yeah, we do it somewhere. Sorry, I, you're muted. You're muted, Marek. Sorry. Uh, so the, that's all the questions in the Q&A. Uh, are you folks going to move to the work adventure or? All right. Yep, sure. I guess that's that's the wrap up of the session. Uh, thank you very much for it. Um, it was very interesting. And uh, yeah. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Goodbye. Enjoy the conference. Thank you. See you. Bye bye.